Welcome. Thanks for joining us for our uh, first investor. We have Mr. Marshall here hanging out with us. We've done some investing before. We've uh, gotten into a few things here and there. And really the point is to help educate our audience to, to know what they're getting themselves into. I've, I, I get so many people that are like, oh, I want to invest. I want to flip houses, right? They watch HGTV shows and then halfway through they're like, oh my goodness, what did I get myself into? Right. So we want to try to help those people kind of get educated, go over some key terms. And as we go along, I want to get like dig deeper and deeper into it. But I think this first episode, we're just going to go over some key stuff that you and I have learned over the years with uh, investing and so forth. How's that sound? Sounds great. Happy to be here. Dang, yeah, that's awesome. I appreciate your time. So what we're going to do first is we're going to go over some of the main terms. And some people know the terms. So if you already know it, we're going to go over it and kind of what it is and some of the strategies we use. So we're talking about the most uh, frequent we hear in HGTV everywhere is flip. What do you? What is our flip? What is that? Right. So that's the standard one that, that most people do. It's when you purchase a property, you look at it, you make, usually you have to do some make ready costs. You have to know some after repair values. You have to know what the current market it trends are. You want to repair it well enough that you can turn around and flip the property. You need to be careful about seasoning depending upon the financing. Yeah. You also need to be careful about, um, sorry, just lost it. <laughs> We're doing well, man. We're doing well. Oh. So you say flip, though. So flip means you're taking it from crappy to ready to sell, basically. That's usually the most common The most common yeah. one that they're doing is most people are finding a home. To, we, we use a term called distressed sometimes. It could be yeah. something as simple as just maybe it needs some updates. Yeah. Structurally, it's sound. It needs some cosmetic updates. And then you turn around and flip the property in three to six months. It depends, again, on the financing. You do have some seasoning period. Or if you do hard le- money lending or yeah, private lending or commercial lending. So you there's, need to be aware. There's even some things with the buyers in some situations. Like, you be careful what loans you sell the house to. Sometimes they'll need an extra appraisal if it's being flipped too quickly. Uh, some caveats and some safety nets to help protect people. Um, when you look for those, um, do you have – you do your cost analysis, I assume, and kind of get an idea. What are some of the things that you don't believe people even – think of when they put those numbers together? I think a few things would be you need to have some type of spreadsheet. There, there are so many software programs out there now that work with your, like we said, it's called ARV or after repair value, yeah. your initial purchase price, what those costs are with your contractor, your material costs. A lot of people tend to forget the holding costs. There's mm, time yeah. when you purchase a property until you repair it to go ahead and sell it. So you have to worry about holding costs. There are also hidden costs that are involved transfer taxes, closing taxes, all those things you need to consider when you're going around and fixing and flipping the property. And then, of course, the actual contractor cost for insurance purposes. You want to make sure that you're insured yourself. You also have a binder policy on that or an umbrella policy on the property until you go to flip it. In, in, in later episodes, I think you and I will break down like ways to get uh, the funds. Mm-hmm. I mean, flips, you can't finance a flip the traditional way, so we'll end up getting that later on. But if you have a house that's a little more dinged up, beat up, and, and you're looking at houses to fix up, that's where our, our flip term comes from. Right? Absolutely. Cool. So that's our first one. The next one is I think one of the ones you've done a lot more than I have is uh, the holds. What is a hold? Yeah, so typically uh, I look at, I call them buy and hold. And yeah. those are 10 to 15 or 20 years. I look at that as a wealth generation avenue or yeah. strategy. The, you have some tax benefits when you're holding. Uh, that there really comes down to something about your criteria. You need to know exactly what you're doing uh, with your strategy. You need to understand your, your, your criteria. I really like Michael Zuber, for example, from One Rental at a Time, calls it his buy box. Okay. You need to be able to articulate to every person that you meet exactly what it is that you're looking for in your market. For example, here in Calvert County, my buy box is different than some of the other counties where I invest in small multifamily dwellings. Yeah. But if you once you have your buy box, then really it comes the agent's um, aspect where you need to set up the automated searches. So you get to see that. I, get, I love looking at my automated searches every morning. And I know exactly what <laughs> exactly. I'm looking at. I yeah. learn my market. And it's that daily discipline so that when those properties come on, I know exactly which ones are good or great deals rather than the average market. And then from that area, then it's really setting up your, your spreadsheet. You need to know what, what the numbers are from not only the pity, the principal, insurance, taxes, um, payment, but also you need to know, for example, capital expenditures. You have to make repairs. Yeah. So you need to yeah. allocate a certain amount each month for that. Or property management. If you're going to self-manage, you may not need to include that. But if you have a larger portfolio, you'll want a property management company. You need vacancy. You know, one, the biggest drop down and buy and hold strategy really is the vacancy. That'll kill any investor. It will. Um, from yeah. there. So you make sure you allocate a little bit each month. 
for the vacancy. And you, you talk to property managers, you talk to realtors, you can see what right. vacancy rates are in that area. You also have utility and maintenance. Once you allocate all of those in, you really want to look for a positive cash flow, but buy and hold strategy can be a wonderful long term. Certainly not a get rich quick. No, long term. It, yeah, it's a, yeah. And a lot of people forget about the tax write offs when they do their profits. I, they, they, there's some write offs involved in those too, and you have to make sure you account for that too, I assume. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, ta- the tax deferment is great for that, and also the, the equity over time. You're also paying down the principal. Yeah. If you keep it uh, rented, the tenants tend to pay down a lot of that principal for you too. So there are some wonderful uh, reasons why I prefer the buy and hold strategy. Okay, and there's that gets you into, I don't. T- usually put enough R's into it, but it's a B R R R. Yeah. So <laughs> I, many think, R's. I think David Green <laughs> wrote a great book called the Burr, or came up with the Burr strategy or Brandon Turner on bigger pockets. I'm a big bigger pockets fan. Yeah, yeah. But uh, I think they, they coined the term, but it stands for essentially buying the property. Yeah. Then you repair the property. Then you want to go ahead and rent the property. Once you rent it, and then you want to go ahead and refinance the property. And that refinance then is when you can typically, if you've planned well, pull your money back out. And then some people say rents or repeat. You can repeat the whole process. So essentially, you may only have to put your capital or use private money lending the first time. So usually, typically, when you get into that renovation style loan, the rates are a little bit higher. Is that a key factor in being able to refinance to a lower rate and pull the money out? That's a great point. You certainly have to think about that when you're running your numbers, the holding yeah. cost and the higher rate. But again, if you find the right deal, they're, they're definitely it's a definitely a positive way. So that way you refinance, pull the rates back down, pull the money back out and buy another one. And you could pay off your private money lender if you did yeah. that way or re, you know replenish your own cash reserves if you used yours to fund the repairs. That's awesome. Yeah, it's a great strategy. Okay, good. So that's the first thing. Flip, hold, burr. <laughs> right. Yeah, so too many hours. And then we're going to briefly go over wholesale. Can you just explain? Because I've, I've read I, online, I read the wholesale, and I read about it. It's really hard to conceptualize. Yeah, but wholesale, it's, how, do, how does it look? So wholesale, essentially, and I, I think you're right. Maybe we could go deeper into this we in will. a different yeah. video. But essentially what you do is an existing seller, you would uh, sort of write that contract over and assume the contract of the existing payments, and then you would assign that to a third party that they would go to closing and you would wholesale the property that way. So you would legally transfer the title over into that third party. So you're a middleman. Absolutely. You're so you just take man. somebody that needs to get rid of something, but doesn't want to put the time and the effort in finding them, and you tell them, I can find somebody for you, not a problem, but I'm not going to do it for free. Absolutely. There's a, <laughs> yeah. a lot that goes into it as far yeah. as marketing, finding those off-market deals, the connections, and you want to provide a value. You need to meet with the people and see what their, their needs really are and make sure it's beneficial for them as well. And then, like you said, again, you need that third party who's willing to assume or take on. Take on. That's, yeah. yeah, that's an interesting situation. you gotta, you got to be really into it, I think, with a lot of ties and a lot of connections for that. Absolutely. Yeah. All right, cool. And then the last one is the... Uh, the, the um, Visbo, Airbnb style as well, and um, a key to that one. And it's fairly new, I think, in investing. I think we have really started to take off in the last like couple of years, really, for that. So I know one of the keys for that one is location. I, absolutely. The short-term rental market, I typically, and, and that is not my area of expertise. Yet. Um, like you said, yet. Well, we'll see. <laughs> it's uh, location, 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 location. You typically see higher returns. Yeah. But you also have more, and you're more involved up front. Obviously, you have more tenants coming in on a yeah. shorter basis, oh, yeah. quicker basis. Yeah. The staging process, the upkeep and the maintenance. So there's a lot that goes into it. But if you have the right systems in place, I think short term rentals can be a phenomenal big. way. It is uh, way more hands on than a, a rental, a buy and hold, because buy and hold, you just pick, stick somebody in there and they're living in the house, they're doing their own thing. This one, it's got to be, they come out every three to four days. You got to have the cleaning lady come through. You got to have like stuff on the do. You got to have a sign in book. Like it's almost like you're running a hotel. Like it's almost a bed and breakfast. Absolutely. It's, it's really interesting. It's a great way to look at things, and, I, and especially in certain areas, like you said. Again, location yeah. is the most important factor. Yeah, and I'm picking up a few here uh, near the beaches in various areas. So we're going to elaborate this as the year goes through. We can talk about all the stuff that I screwed up. <laughs> <laughs> I've been there. We've all been there. Every any investor that's never lost money is lying to me. Yeah, that's right. The stuff I do well and stuff I, well, the stuff that I mess up. But I, I think we can really have a uh, deep conversation about the, uh, phys, uh, the Verbo, yeah. Airbnbs, and... I think it's going to be sticking around because I think a lot of people love the idea of being in a house rather than a hotel room and having access to things and just kind of like temporarily living in a place for four days and how much more ingrained in the community those things are. So I think you're absolutely right. It's going to be interesting. Yeah.
So those are our terms. It's flip, hold, wholesale, Airbnb, and brr. Now, you said you briefly talked about your Excel sheet. So do you look for specific formulas for different things? And I ask this because if our audience is watching this and they at the moment have like a couple bucks in their pocket, maybe they, they cash in retirement versus I don't have a lot of money or I have an investor, there's going to be different strategies that work best for them, I assume. Absolutely. Depending upon where you are, you have to take your, your current structure where you are and then yeah. you can start researching and educate yourself. But once you identify the strategy, then it, again, I think it's just being consistent, a daily discipline, yeah. and sticking to that spreadsheet, whatever it is, working it out. For example, for me, it's making sure my numbers uh, run and I see a positive, I like cash on cash return of a certain percentage of my markets. And then when I know what that average rate is, I look for the good and great deals from there. I've lost more than I've won. And that's that's okay with me as that's long right. as, but you need to be consistent. Well, even when you lose, sometimes you get write-offs and things too, so sometimes you still win. Absolutely. Now, where do you get all those formulas? Is it just from experience, from a website? What have you researched? Where are you getting some of these formulas and information from? All three. All three? Uh, you're never, I'm an educator by trade. This is, obviously, um, I do real estate investing on the side. And, yeah. uh, and it's because I'm passionate about it. I want to stay busy. Uh, but I my, my W-2 job helps fund a lot, a lot of the of down stuff. payments for yeah. me. So that's one, an avenue that I use. There's also the private lending, the hard money lending. There are a, There's a plethora of strategies to get financing. That typically is the biggest barrier for a lot of people yeah. up front. But yeah. re, in reality, when you get in, you realize if you find the great deals, you will find the money. <laughs> now you say you're uh, W-2, but you are also in the industry. Don't sell it. Don't, we don't want people to just think that they can just like do this on the side for fun. You will have a little bit of background. Like yeah, you were in the mortgage own, industry and I you've know, done it before. Absolutely. Yeah. I've been in the mortgage industry. I've yeah. owned rental property since 2005. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, we want to be sure people are like ready, ready. Like, oh, I can right, just jump take, in and do it. Yeah, it does take some time. <laughs> takes educating yourself, meeting the right people, networking too. Yeah, oh doubt. yeah, networking, having the plumber, having the electrician, having the... And talking to people, letting them know. Again, go back to your buy box like I talked about. I have to give Michael Zuber credit for that. Yeah. If you know exactly and you can articulate exactly what you're looking for, you'll be amazed at the, what people will find for you. Yeah. Oh yeah, that's what I do all the time. <laughs> Finding stuff for people. Um, we talked a little bit about financial backing options. You said hard money. So hard money, when you're, if people don't know what that is, it's just an investor or somebody who just happens to have a lot of money and are looking for ways to divvy it out, like invest in properties without doing all the work, really, is right. what it is. So, yeah, so typically the interest rates are going to be higher because it is a hard money and the terms will be shorter. Okay. And those individuals are looking to deploy their cash reserves more than what they're getting right now. Got it. it, be, it could it be to offset inflation as a leverage? It could be because at a bank it's you know, less than one percent or yeah, yeah, yeah. a certain form. So that's what they're doing. Those terms are shorter, and the interest rates are higher. You typically will have to pay some points up front, and those are certainly good avenues if if you are educated. You need I would recommend those for more experienced investors. Private lenders are typically a little less than that, yeah. and they have a little longer terms. And that's that that seems to be a new strategy. Those can be individuals. You can't just walk up to somebody and say, hey, I flip houses. I want some money. You, you had to put together a package or something, right? Absolutely. I recommend a, a proposal. So I have a proposal package that I yeah. give them. It shows them what I've done in the past. It shows them the deal. It shows them that I'm educated and I've researched and, I've, and I have completed and closed on positive loans. Yeah. So that way they feel better about doing it. Because don't, don't just think that you... Uncle Fred's got some money yeah. and you're just going to be able to just, hey, I'm flipping houses, give me some money. That's not the way it works. No, absolutely. Now, you also said banks. I know for sure banks can are very limited in the flipping element of it. They won't flip. You can't get conventional type loans. But the other elements, so you're doing multifamilies and you're getting conventional loans for that. Uh, holds, you can do loans with that. Absolutely. So, even renovation loans. But renovation loans are a beast. you got to be careful. They're, they're definitely a little different. You need to educate yourself. Yeah. It depends, too, if you need to separate between primary residence or investor yeah. loans. Yeah. Uh, if you're going through the bank, typically you're looking at more conventional for investors, conventional loans. There are other portfolio loans you can do depending upon what you're looking for. Uh, typically, there's a certain number that most QM banks will allow you, qualified mortgage lenders will allow you to have in your portfolio, and then you may need to go off market if you have more than that. But in the beginning, starting out, a lot of my single family dwellings, most people don't know this. They think that they're commercial lending, and you can get primary or gotcha. residence lending on those up to four. So duplexes, triplexes, or quads. So you have commercial lending. I have some commercial lenders we can share as well someday. And then you can do regular lending with residential, but you have to be careful if it's a second home. 
Mm-hmm. If you start getting into like third, fourth home, you've got to be careful because you can't put it in an LLC's name if you're getting outside of that second home spectrum. So you got to be really careful with that. And I'm sure we'll dive down and maybe even bring like a, a lender in with us one of these episodes. But yes, a lender we're just or a tax tapping. attorney. Or a tax <laughs> attorney. We're just tapping into it today, right. though. So you have options. Obviously, cash is the best, but who the heck's got like 300000 cash just laying around? If you, you know them, let me know. <laughs> I'm always looking for more money. <laughs> All right, so you talked a little bit. This is the final topic. Um, you talked a little bit about the resources you use. You have the MLS that you sometimes we send you listings through. What are some of the other resources that you can get legitimate listings that are not Zillow because Zillow's BS? So I, I love Realtor.com as well. Okay. On there, you can also use Redfin. Um, also, networking and marketing for off-market deals. Those are all on-market deals, yeah, typically. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But if you go to the real estate meetups or you start network, networking yeah. with other investors in your area that you're investing in, then you'll hear a lot from them as well. Uh, and then, of course, like you said, the MLS, the MLS is where I find a lot. I mean, people say it's difficult, and they are difficult, but you can still find good deals using the MLS. Sometimes, yeah. Yeah. Um, you can also do courthouse steps. I know they do auctions and stuff still. A lot of those auctions are now online. Mm-hmm. And you got to be very careful with those because what these uh, banks will do is there's fees to put them online. And what they'll do is they'll sneak those in there and make the buyer pay all the listing fees to put it on those websites and stuff as well. So be careful because some of those premiums can be 5%, 6% of the sales price. I think that's a great point. Any, yeah. in, in all this, I think it's important to let your audience know that you need not only to educate yourself, but network and find mentors. People who have done these already, yeah. it's, they're indispensable at leading you down the right path. I had, I've made so many mistakes trying to do things <laughs> myself, whereas if I had taken my own advice and found a mentor earlier, yeah. I think I would have been far better. Or you can keep watching this video series as we do every month and learn all the things you need to know. About. That's the goal. That's it. That's the hope. So the other thing is uh, with Zillow, we'll say, um, Zillow will say pre-foreclosure. If you see on Zillow that says pre-foreclosure, just delete it right away because that is such nonsense. <laughs> pre-foreclosure on Zillow means somebody missed a payment or was behind on a payment and it has to be recorded. Uh, the, the lender records that and Zillow gets a hold of it and they pump it out everywhere as if it's really going to foreclosure. Those are just nonsense. Or you so, can do what I do and call Billy Sanders. Yeah, yeah, so that's what everybody else does. Don't hit me up on those. <laughs> I, don't, I don't want to. All right, that's awesome. So we went over the flips, uh, the holds, the wholesales, the uh, seasonal, like the, the, vis, the Airbnb style. We went over some of the formulas you can use and things to talk about as well. And then some of the places we can find them. So these are the basics. This is if you're thinking about doing it or, honestly, if you have uh, a house that maybe somebody left to you or something and you're not sure what to do with it, these are ways that you can strategize to get the most out of your assets. So there's a lot of different things we can talk about. So it'll be more fun next week as well. Absolutely. Yeah, you came in here not knowing what we were doing. So I appreciate your time. Loved it. All right, sir. We'll see you again next month. Thank you.